Hey there, I'm Matthew. And I'm Kenneth. And we just finished watching Star Trek V. Star Trek V is about a charismatic Vulcan named Cybok who uses a combination of his philosophy to embrace emotion and the power of mind melding to remove people's pain and develop a sort of following around himself. And he wants to use this ability to venture to the center of the galaxy beyond the Great Barrier to find the fabled Garden of Eden in the Vulcan cosmology. And of course, the starship he chooses is the Enterprise, and that's why this is a Star Trek movie. Right. Well, if we're going by the Star Trek rule of thumb, this movie is odd-numbered and therefore bad. Right. But I'm going to go ahead and say that I really like this movie. Oh. I was surprised by how much I like this movie. I have seen chunks of it before. Mm -hmm. I know the general plot, and I thought it was going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. It was like a showdown with God who shoots lightning bolts out of his eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I was expecting the worst, but I really liked it. I mean... It has problems. I, yeah. A lot of lines at the beginning where there's, you know, a little too much exposition, a mm -hmm. little awkward. Like, they do all this great setup for how the paradise planet works. You mm -hmm. know, and it's this old, uh, you know, some great model of peace or whatever. Now it's just gone to shit. But, and then yeah. they come out and say it. Mm -hmm. You know, they have the characters each say it again and again. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I got it the first time. So. I kind of cringe when I see things like that because you know you, you yeah. showed without telling, and then you right. you told me again. <laughs> yes, yes. But I don't know. It's got some great stuff. I think the best scene in this movie for me is the confrontation between uh, Bones, Spock, Kirk, and Cybok. Mm -hmm. We finally get to see what it is that Cybok is doing. He's not brainwashing people. He's just using some kind of technique similar to a mind meld, I guess, mm -hmm. to tap into what their deepest pain is and revealing it to them and then giving a kind of... He's kind of like a cross between a psychologist and a psychic or something. He's trying to help them deal with it, but in a way that is advantageous to himself. He kind of comes across as like an evangelical, uh, you know, preacher and, the, you know, televangelist kind of. Right, but I love the the bit where Bones and his father, right? He he Bones kills his father, and this is his ultimate painful memory that Cybok wants to remove, right? Right. But So why is it painful? We see it through the scene. Well, obviously he loves his father and hates to see him in pain. And he also hates to harm his father, which is what, also what he would be doing right. by killing him. So what does it really mean to take away the pain? What can it be other than letting go the kind of attachment that he has to his father, right? You see, this is kind of a theme in a lot of uh, religious traditions where you say, well... You have this pain, this pain is caused by attachment, you, know, you just got to give up attachment. It sounds like a very neat little formula when you apply it to, like, piles of money or something. Mm. Like, oh, you need to stop caring about piles of money. But when it comes to family members, all of a sudden it's starting to sound a little bit crazy. And when yeah. Kirk gives the little defense where, I don't want my pain taken away, I need my pain, I think that that's... That's probably the most compelling and interesting ethical argument that I've ever seen in a movie. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's a, that's you, quite a statement there. <laughs> you don't movies don't have things like this. Where did this scene come from? Yeah, I mean, I can't think of another movie where a main character takes kind of an off kilter or controversial position on a really common ethical issue, mm -hmm. and it was interesting or convincing to me in any way. Um, that whole scene was really well done. I agree. Um, uh, the whole thing with Kirk, he's the, he's the skeptic and throughout the whole ending sequence, he's constantly questioning everything that's going on. He's right. He's proven right in almost every, every element of it. Just what does God need with a starship, you know, and all that. But that scene in particular, though, I liked how it called back to the beginning. So where Bones is dealing with his father's death, um, he, at the beginning of the movie, Kirk is climbing El Capitan in Yosemite and Bones just goes on a rant about how life is far too precious to risk it on stupid stunts like that. He values life so much and he regrets having killed off his father because there was a cure to his father's disease after he had euthanized him. And he goes on this long speech, just it connects those two aspects of Bones' character, which I thought was really good. And I also like the subtlety with which they showed Spock's pain. His whole thing throughout the series is that he always gets this feeling that his father kind of resents him because he's half 
human and the human element of him that makes him go off and be a Starfleet member instead of being uh, someone high up in the Vulcan society. There's a certain problem that he has with the you know his fa between him and his father and that that manifests from the beginning from when he was born and I like the subtlety of that especially yeah and that's another great part of the confrontation scene with Cybok right what does Cybok see as Spock's greatest pain the fact that his father sees him as human yeah right and yet and when Cybok asks him to come with him what does Spock say he says well I'm not that person anymore who's an outcast I I have this thing I belong to, you know, mm -hmm. I'm part of the crew of the Enterprise. And so being like a human is integral to the way that Spock is and to sort of erase his pain, right, of not worrying anymore about his father thinking that as human. That is what has brought him there. It's what made him, has made him what he is. Yeah. So I don't know. It's just, it's interesting. It's a nice little argument and they don't spell it out for you. They just give you all the character elements. Mm -hmm. And I kind of regret, actually, that we don't get to see what Kirk's little scene is, you know? He, he, yeah. yeah. He just re refuses <laughs> to undergo it, you know? But you get the feeling that no matter what it is, he's not going to be convinced. Really. Yeah, yeah. That is that is a good element of the movie. It's also, it's also one of the biggest common criticisms of the movie is that uh, Kirk plays up his own character at the um, expense of the other ones in some ways. Yeah, so he's got writing credits. Yes. And I've heard that an earlier draft, everybody betrays him. Yes. Even, even Bones and Spock. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm glad they didn't. <laughs> yeah. right. Apparently, Apparently, the two actors, apparently uh, Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly, they refused to do that. Like, oh, the characters would never do this. And well, good for them. Yeah. Because that's, them not doing that is the best part of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I think as far as depicting the trio, um, you know, they, throughout the whole television show, it was always the three of them. They always got the most development. And this movie, probably more than all the other ones, shows the most interplay between the three of them. You know, them and the brig, uh, you know, being put in prison by Cybok. You get a lot of uh, verbal sparring between them, but that's a lot of fun. Like, uh, uh, Kurt telling... Telling Spock, you know, for you betraying us, I should just kick your ass. And then Bo Bones is saying, well, "You want me to yeah, hold? hold him? <laughs> you want me to hold him?" <laughs> One nice little thing I like about this scene: as soon as Spock reveals that Cyborg was his brother, Bones starts defending Spock against Kirk, which is, you know, it's a fun little bit there. We could have got a little bit more into Cyborg's character because the, the big reveal at the end is yeah. that he realizes that it's his own arrogance that's brought him to the center of the galaxy, that this, yeah. this vision of the Eden of Vulcan was constructed by his own. He made it up in his own mind. And mm -hmm. It was just, he didn't understand. He, he thought he was the one to make it great. But we don't really get a lot of build-up for that. I mean, we get that he is sort of charismatic and has this kind of cult about him, and so he's probably arrogant. But we yeah. don't have really any insight into his character other than that. I was thinking maybe they could have done something like during the sequence where he's sharing Spock's pain, and we see a little bit of Cybok as well. Yeah, that would have been nice. Yeah. It didn't, I mean, it could have been better. Yeah. It's not a perfect movie, but yeah. I enjoyed it. I liked yeah. it. Oh, well, yeah, I, I enjoy it too. I mean, uh, elements of it make me feel like that this is more of a guilty pleasure movie, though, just because of there are a lot of scenes in there that it just. Uh, bring it and I, I don't want to say too much bring it down but just or just like that's an odd scene okay it, yeah so scotty hits his head on yeah something and yeah he hits it on a bulkhead or something yeah like oh wow okay that's a little weird that it, they're having a silly scene yeah. like this but then it turns out that's not even like a little silly scene right he didn't just hit his head ha ha like he they show him later and he's like out cold and yeah. bloody yeah yeah <laughs> it's just like how weird to treat like a a beloved main character like Scotty yeah. is like knocked unconscious and bleeding from his forehead, and the the payoff is like it's like this little gag, like it cartoonishly bonks his head on. Something. Yeah, well, going along with that, this movie kind of introduces that him and Uhura are in a relationship or something, which yeah. doesn't go anywhere and doesn't make much sense. And 
So that's weird. That's a weird nugget in the movie. And and the fan dance. And the weird. fan dance. Oh, yes. Yeah, I was waiting to bring things up. Just bizarre. I, I mean, it's things like that. And, you know, the, the triple-breasted cat lady in the bar. <laughs> it's that's true. It, yeah, what? Did Kurt kill that cat lady? I don't know. He throws her into a pool or something. He, thro he throws her into a pool. It's a pool. A pool. It's pool. a pool. Pool table. <laughs> it doesn't seem like that would kill so landing in I, a small I, volume of water. Yeah, I, but she's just like floating there, like she's a dead. It. I. Yeah. I. <laughs> I don't know. It's. Yeah. It's little bizarre things like that, which I think. See, I. Like I said, I do actually enjoy this movie as well, but it's um, things like that that make me kind of hesitant to say that just because these little scenes are the kind of things where if they show up in a movie, it's like that can almost ruin a whole movie. It's like, how am I supposed to take certain elements of this seriously when other parts are just so completely bonkers and not even like in a funny way. I mean, there are funny parts in the movie that I enjoy, like all of Spock's dry comments throughout the entire movie have been, were, you know, were a, a lot of fun. But, but then things like that, like Uhura and Scotty, their relationship thing was supposed to be played off as a joke. Uh, Sulu and Chekhov aren't given much of anything to do with just given a couple of gags in the movie even though oh sulu had a nice part though where he had to pilot the shuttle back into the enterprise manually so so that was that was okay but that aside it's just like oh well these other these other characters don't matter it's the three leads which i which i can agree with but they turn the other ones into jokes which brings down the movie i think yeah it's a classic problem trying to Make a movie of a TV show. Yeah. Because you don't have a season's worth of time to trade off stories between main characters. Right. To fit it all into one thing. Yeah, and going along with that, this movie was probably the most like a Star Trek episode, where this is the sort of thing that would happen in the TV show. And yeah, it's not connected to the overall storyline from the previous ones, even though they reference it a few times. It's kind of like the first movie. There's a lot of slow setup, and there's this big mystery waiting out there. Yeah. And they slowly get there, and then the ending is it's like, oh, we all learned, we learned something. It's like a real science fiction. Yeah. Or did we learn something? Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the first movie, when they were going into the Great Barrier, all I was thinking was... If this was the first movie, that would have taken like a good twenty minutes to get in through there. Yeah. Okay. There's a a shot in this movie mm -hmm. that replaces the whole scene. In the first. Movie. So in the first movie, they're looking at the Enterprise from the shuttle, and it's just taking forever. They're just staring at it. Right. In this movie, what do they do? They're going in a shuttle to the Enterprise. They give you a shot from outside the shuttle through the window. Everybody's looking out, kind of in awe. And yeah. you see on the glass of the window is the moon, the reflection of the moon, and the silhouette of the Enterprise yeah. in the moon. It's just, that's it. That's the perfect shot to convey <laughs> what yeah. is going on. It's just, yeah. it's great. Yeah. The silhouette is all you need. <laughs> and then moving on, right? We don't yeah, need... it doesn't have to take twenty minutes to get to that. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. It's kind of like a rewrite. Yeah, of that movie. It is. It is. Yeah. I don't know. There's. I'm. I'm kind of conflicted on this movie because I. I do. I do enjoy it, but I see the flaws, and they do stand out to me, and they've stood out to me more over time. Because you watch this in context with part two and part six, it's not even close. But. You know, it's an enjoyable movie in its own right. I think in some weird ways, some scenes were helped by the low budget. Like, obviously, some of it was bad. Yeah. But, like, when they show the Great Barrier and the space stuff, to represent the Great Barrier, instead of having all this crazy special effects stuff, mm -hmm. it's just kind of like an overlay of differently colored liquids being swirled together. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like, well, this is so abstract that it's almost just symbolic, right? Mm -hmm. It's not even a picture of a phenomenon in space anymore. It's just kind of, I don't know, I like that. It, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was simple. Yeah. Everything is now just like crazy. Mm -hmm. Like if they did this movie today, it would just be so crazy CG particle <laughs> effect. Yeah. And I would just be like, oh, well, okay. Yeah, I've seen this a million times before. But here right. it's just, it's so basic. It's a little bit more powerful, I think, when it's simple. One of the weaker parts of the movie, I thought, was the Klingon that, the random Klingon who's after Kirk just because yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, we need, we need some way to uh, resolve the ending. So we're going to toss this Klingon in there. 
he's going to make some conflict in some parts, but in the end, it's he's going to be used to resolve the <laughs> the movie. And it's if they turn his plot line into like a serious thing, like he hates the Federation for whatever reason, that could have been like a neat thing where you're watching two plots converge at the end or you know something a little more and i liked uh i like that general guy who basically puts that klingon captain in his place but it's like he has a character arc at the end all of a sudden i mean they they constantly mention him oh he's like a washed up klingon uh and he's fallen out of favor and then at the end come on do something and then he's like all right i'll do something <laughs> yeah i think that the Klingon captain is interesting. It just is not helpful to the plot of the movie in any way. Yeah. It kind of shows that there's some other references to this in the show, but the, the Klingon Empire is kind of getting a little bit decadent and ridiculous with the whole warrior cultural culture thing mm. getting to the point where people are proud of just like blowing shit up for the sake of... Yeah. Culture. And it, it's less to do with honor and more to do with just killing things. And this guy is... He just... He's just shooting you know, space probes, and he just, he yeah. wants to kill something, and oh, I can kill Kirk, yeah, and then when he gets the opportunity to just basically murder Kirk in the shell, he just doesn't hesitate, he's like, all right, we're just gonna shoot him, yeah. you know, that's not honorable, right, so it, it gives a little insight into how the things may be going badly for the Klingon Empire in terms of its uh, leadership, perhaps, but it has nothing to do with the plot, so <laughs> yeah, therefore it's not that great well yeah they, they see that plot line they could have done something with that but yeah so there there are a lot of holes and such in the movie but um there's a whole little sub uh, not really a subplot just an element of it where in the previous film they get a new enterprise and then they reveal at the beginning of this movie well it turns out this enterprise is a big pile of crap because the doors won't open and so on and it's like it's a running gag throughout the movie and they kind of use that as just a, a plot excuse to make the transporter not work. So <laughs> this is this is like Into Darkness, where it's like the transporter never works, and that kind of uh, makes it so the plot can happen. Yeah, the transport was a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a uh, quote by Gerard Tolkien where he says that he kind of maybe regretted inventing the eagles because they just cause too many plot holes or too many jet get out of jail free cards <laughs> yeah and i don't i don't know if there's a similar quote by mm -hmm. gene roddenberry about the, the transporters having but there ought to be because the transporter <laughs> they just it, they're too powerful yeah they're too good yeah they're, they're too good it's, it's just you need them out of commission in order for, to have a plot and it's like you got to do this in every movie now where it has its limits you can't teleport someone if uh, if the shields are up and so on but this one just took it to the nth degree nothing works on the ship you know well then why at the beginning didn't they get if uh that admiral at the beginning wanted kirk to go on this mission why didn't he give him a ship that worked so well i don't you could kind of say that it's kind of a diplomatic resolution thing and kirk has a lot of clout and seeing the enterprise would be oh it's the enterprise See, that raises other questions, too, with Cybok, though. Like, how did he get on Nimbus 3 at the beginning? If he if he's able to get a ship that, to take him there, then couldn't he use that ship to also go through the Great Barrier? Why does it have to specifically be a starship? He doesn't... Do you think that was really William Shatner on the side of... The yes. Planet? Yes, Matt. I think it was really William Shatner. He was really climbing El Capitan. <laughs> Do you think that he was really flying up? The side of El Capitan and rocket boots. It isn't that what was really happening, Matt. Do you think that was a real campsite with the beans? Are they really eating beans? Is <laughs> 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 that real whiskey? <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. You know, all things considered, I think even though this is William Shatner's first crack at the director's chair, I thought he did a fine job uh, as far as the imagery is concerned, especially in that scene that we talk about where uh, Cybok confronts them with their pain just the way it's staged and everything was really really well done like it would be McCoy talking to his father and then Cybok would walk in from out of frame say something that's relevant to what's going on then walk back out of frame right it really gives the feeling that he's intruding into Bones's memories and making little hints and suggestions here like yeah just, just say a little thing and then leave mm -hmm. as if you know he's yeah poking right in I, I like it yeah 
Well, uh, in the context of the other movies, so you've seen one through five now. Where does this one fit in? I really like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Although, I, Wrath of Khan is too good. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to usurp that one. Yeah, no, I'll, I'm putting this movie second after Wrath of God. Oh wow! Oh, well, that's great. I, yeah, yeah. I thought this was really good. All right, yeah. I I like it better than the first one, of course. <laughs> this is like the first one, but without all the filler. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed this movie as well, actually. I, I don't know if I'm partly influenced by what other people say, where it's just like, this is a bad movie. Well, uh, yeah, I guess I can see the bad parts, but I, every time I see it, I, I was, you know, when, when we watch a lot of, you know, schlocky bad movies, Matt, we were constantly making comments about certain things and we were completely engaged with this movie. I mean, there were little parts where it's like, oh, this is odd or something, but most of it, we were really invested in what was going on i could tell it's just we weren't saying much it's just oh, this is a you know an engaging movie it doesn't really lose me very much right so um yeah in that regard you know it's underrated schlock parts aside uh so maybe this sounds pretentious but people always say that uh, you know in order for it to be sci-fi you gotta like learn something you know you gotta mm -hmm. think about uh, man's place in the universe and all these things yeah and I think this movie does that. And it's not just because it has, like, a monster that's supposed to be God in it. It's because of the whole ethical question of the, you know, cyborg taking away people's pain. And whether, if that's even a good thing, whether that's even something you would want. Or if you had it done to you, whether that would change you as a person. So you get both of those from Kurtz is the first, and then you have Spock and Bones get their pain taken away, but they decide not to follow mm -hmm. cyborgs. I think that... Just that alone, it meets the criteria. It's real science fiction. What do you want? It's, it's not, you know, the new Star Trek movie. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but it's got the street cred. Ah. It's, it's authentic, I think. All right, all right. Well, in that case, good job, William Shatner. Good job. Even though you were against putting that scene in the movie, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm just kidding. If you're listening. All right, well, um, those are our thoughts on... Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.